We've been talking a lot about Eliza Blue on this show. Eliza Blue is a self-described survivor of sex trafficking who has gotten a lot of attention online, who has even on Twitter informally advised Elon Musk on how to handle that kind of content on the platform. And was inter she was interviewed um, all over alternative and right-wing media. But her story has now been heavily criticized and scrutinized. And a lot of people think she made up her own victim narrative narrative in order to go down this route of fame. Now, Eliza has tweeted in response to being called out. She says this, my story as a survivor of human trafficking is 100% real, sadly. I had nothing to do with the paid PR campaign to destroy me. There was no real reason for me to trend on Twitter on and off for two and a half weeks. Real people who I, I knew and loved fell for an op designed to destroy me. Journalists are asking for an interview or a quote. Read all three articles. That's the quote. Publish that. Tim Cass got the interview. Cashman did the work and weeks of research. Interview Shane Cashman. So Shane Cashman is a writer for Tim Pool for Tim Cast, uh, who interviewed her at great length. Although I saw subsequently those articles were out, and now they've actually been taken off of the Tim Pool website. Joining us today to discuss all of this is YouTuber and podcaster and host of the Blair White Project. Blair White joins us now to discuss. Thrilled to have you on Rising, Blair. Thank you so much for having me. And I watched the video uh, you did on the Eliza Blue subject the other day, and I, I actually thought it was one of the best so far going over all the ins and outs of her story over the year. So, you know, for someone, uh, say we have someone watching who doesn't know why they should care about this, you know, wh what do you think is, is the big headline here for wh why this person has become so influential and why it's important to many of us to kind of shine a light and, and call into question some of the really sketchy uh, things about her backstory? Well, I think many people, especially people that find themselves politically in the center or on the right, are deeply concerned with internet censorship. That's why this story is, in fact, so important to so many people, because somehow through this story that now appears to be fabricated that Eliza Blue was human trafficked apparently multiple times throughout the years. Now that that story is following through, people are asking, how did someone whose story was so shaky rise to such prominence and power on social media, get the ear of one of the most powerful men on the planet, Elon Musk, and then was able to actually abuse the system to censor people who criticized her or questioned her story. So we thought that we had turned sort of a corner when Elon Musk bought Twitter, and we thought that, you know, at least on that platform in particular, censorship was something that maybe people wouldn't have to worry about as much. However, clearly that's not the case because for some reason, Eliza Blue was able to pull strings at Twitter and people were simply posting screenshots of publicly made music videos that she willingly and consensually participated in years ago were getting completely banned. And, you know, maybe it seems petty to some people, oh, someone's Twitter was banned. For many people in this day and age, that's their living. That's the way they make money. Um, perhaps not directly, but oftentimes these creators were promoting their YouTube videos, which do make them money. As a YouTube creator myself, that's my entire career. That's my entire livelihood. I was not personally banned, but many people were false flagged on YouTube as well, which is actually illegal. So this woman is actually engaging in censorship and illegal activity to cover up her story for what reason we don't really know because I don't particularly find just participating in music videos shameful but if that poke holes in my story of being trafficked maybe I would have the same urge to shut people down right but, so she's been she's uh, been very, very unfortunate she, Eliza Blue is very nonspecific about the nature of what happened to her. Um, you, you played a clip uh, in your video of Katie Herzog, who's another great um, independent content creator, asking her about this, and she just like would not talk about it. She didn't go into yeah. detail when she was on Tim Pool recently, when she was on with Michael Malice. So nonspecific, and then we find out she, you know, she has a kind of. Uh, history of she, you know, was trying to do uh, reality TV. Um, she was a uh, groupie for uh, My Chemical Romance, I believe. You know, she had all these other kinds of trying to be a, a famous person, and then it seems she lands on, oh, I was a victim of this really terrible crime, and by the way, I know exactly who did it, but I'm not going to say, and I'm not going to, you know, give any verifying details. And and now there have actually been friends and family members of hers who knew her at the time and said, yeah, like nothing close to this ever happened. 
Right. And, you know, I'm not of the mindset that just because someone is a victim of a crime, particularly a sex crime, that that person must go forward and publicize the name of their abuser publicly. And that's just a given. I don't believe that at all. However, if you're going to make money off of this supposed crime, if you're going to rise to prominence and fame, and if you're going to purport to be an expert in, you know, that situation, then you absolutely should provide some details of what happens to you. If for only the reason that it helps people understand the issue better. So, you know, people would up until recently hail her as an expert on this issue. But once people really started looking at it, they said, what does she really do as it pertains to this issue? She provides words on Twitter about it. She goes on podcasts talking about it. But there's no actual evidence she helps real victims. She claimed to open a uh, humanity house, it was called, which was a safe haven for trafficking victims. But that charity does not exist anywhere on paper. Uh, there's no proof that she's ever taken anyone into that. And yet she's used that to, you know, prop herself up as someone who's doing good in that world. And people have an issue with that. You know, I'm someone who takes that issue seriously. And what's funny is I don't think that you have to be a victim of something to advocate upon that issue. She didn't have to make up any sort of story that she was a victim of human trafficking to make that her issue and to, you know, become an influencer based on that. So it's real unfortunate. I think that trafficking is in some circles becoming a buzzword, which it really should not be. This is a serious issue um, and it has been for a long time. And so I hope between this story and the Andrew Tate story, people don't just tune out when they hear the word trafficking because every day there's people who are real victims of this crime and who have their lives taken from them. Yeah, it's so interesting because I, I keep thinking, like, if she had been rising in the ranks on the left, she wouldn't really have gotten into this problem because um, the standard of, you know, believe all women is, um, you know, much <laughs> lower on the left. And the, she could say now, you know, it, it, there, nobody would question if some on the left somebody said, look, you know, I thought it was consensual then, but I realize now it's not. In fact, um, you know, Monica Lewinsky said something very similar about her relationship with Bill Clinton recently. And I, I think actually that made a lot of sense. Right. She was, you know, 18, 20 year old at the time. She thought it was consensual. She was in love. And now she realizes that she was taking and taken advantage of. Um, so, you know, it's so funny to me that she got into trouble, it seems like, because almost like she she picked the wrong political side to, to be, you know, she picked the side where you don't really, just like you said, Blair, you don't really need to have the identity in order to advocate for something. But she, you know, talk to me about how you see all this. Do you think this is an interesting, uh, interesting thing to have noticed? Correct. You know, on my YouTube channel, I advocate, you know, for and against issues all the time that have not personally affected my life. You don't have to, you know, make up a backstory that it actually happens to you to make that your issue. And in fact, I, as someone who's been in the online right space for about seven years now and who this has been my career and I've appeared on pretty much every podcast that she has as well. And so I would have loved as someone who's both involved in that world and, you know, have witnessed people rise and fall from fame and that world would have loved for there to be an organic, you know, influencer that rose up in the ranks, that this was really their issue. And it's just unfortunate because now I think that there is going to be a void of people who are talking about this. Um, I'm going to, you know, do my part as always that I do, you know, sexual predation and sex crimes are a big uh Part of my channel in terms of what I talk about. So I do think that's important. But, you know, going forward, like I said, between this and the Andrew Tate story, I think people are really starting to tune out when they hear the word trafficking. And that is, I think, the worst part about the entire story. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I you know, we've talked about Andrew Tate on the show a lot here. And I, I mean, I, I think obviously the things he said over the years are really gross and bad. He's accused of very gross and bad things. He's, he's very seems to me credibly accused of sexual misconduct, of maybe felonious business-related activity. It all sounds really bad. And then they want to say, and it's also sex trafficking. And I, and I say, well, and may, maybe it is. I don't know. I have to see the evidence. But sex, you know, sex trafficking from a just a basic definition, unless we're quibbling over definitions, involves like, you know, for, you know keeping people locked in rooms or, or chained and you know, selling that. It's not just 
it's not just prostitution. It's not just sexual misconduct. It's you know it's a greater thing. It often involves uh, you know minorities, pe uh, uh, immigrants, people being taken from one country to another. Um, I don't know that that's really the case with him. Which is not to say there's nothing illegal going on there. It, it very well may mm -hmm. be legal. It may even be sex trafficking. But they they go to that, and I've noticed that in a lot of other contexts as well. So I, I think that's a good point. Like things can be bad without being sex trafficking. And it seemed like Eliza Blue needed it. But then it, it was it, like she was including the fact that, that there were these videos that she says were non-consensual, you know, these kind of music videos where she's, uh, you know, very like slightly clothed. I mean, it's softcore. It's not hardcore at all. And she was objecting to people sharing those on YouTube and other places, even though it, you know, it was clear she had no right to have that shut down. And they say, well, is that what you mean by sex trafficking? And it just kind of really got out of control, especially given her ability to compel Twitter and others to like take that content that was critical of her down. Right. I, I see a lot of people these days, and again, it's so unfortunate, but, you know, calling things like having a pimp as a prostitute human trafficking. And it's not quite that, right? And it, mm -hmm. again, there's levels to sexual predation, there's levels to sexual crimes. And as far as the Andrew Tate story, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of seeing that several of these supposed victims have come out and have said, actually, in fact, we are not victims. And because of the corruption that exists in the legal system in Romania, the judge has basically <laughs> overridden their own personal testimony and recounting of what has or has not happened and said, actually, you are victims. So again, this is all sort of deteriorating the idea of trafficking in people's minds. And I have to remind people, this is, you know, people who have their lives taken from them. This is people who have no family, no friends, who are isolated. Eliza Blue had her family intact. And in fact, her family, you know, flew her out of L.A. when it supposedly happened and then allowed her to return. This is not the, an example of someone who was isolated by any means. Um, if you are familiar with the entertainment industry, which I have some familiarity due to my fiance who works, you know, extensively as a producer and has worked in music industry as well. Um, you know, music videos pay like a hundred bucks maybe uh, to video girls that were doing the type of work that Eliza Blue did. It's not exactly a job that a, you know, high status as was claimed human trafficker that Eliza Blue supposedly had would send someone on, right? There's also mm -hmm. interviews of her saying that she turns down offers for sex from people that, you know, the price was up to $150,000. If you're being human trafficked, I don't know what sort of, you know, human trafficker is going to allow you to turn down a 150 k offer, but then send you to do $100 music video gigs. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, these were all great questions that uh, should have been asked all along, but I'm, I'm glad to see are now being asked of her in a lot of the channels we've been talking about. And of course, we've reached out to Eliza for comment and would be thrilled to have her on the show anytime if she would like to. Blair, we really appreciate your time. We're going to be back for another interview with you shortly. Stay tuned, everybody.